Welcome to the Crime Redefined podcast produced by Zero Cliff Media. Coming to you from the U.S. Bank Tower, high above downtown Los Angeles. In our podcast, we drill deep into forensics and criminal investigation from the viewpoint of the defense, as well as explore the intersection of the media and the justice system. I'm Dion Mitchell here with my co-host, Mayhol and Jeria. On this episode of Crime Redefined, we are thrilled to be joined by one of Mayhol's colleagues, nationally renowned police procedure, use of force, and wrongful conviction expert, Timothy T. Williams, Jr., Yeah, I've known Tim for a number of years now, and we are both on the Los Angeles Superior Court Expert Witness Panel. As a matter of fact, Tim and I are working on some of the same cases right now. And, you know, Dion, it seems that whenever I ask an attorney or a pro per inmate that I'm working with who they're using as their police procedure expert, Tim's name always comes up. He's all over the place. And I spoke to him earlier this year uh, when I first learned that he had a book coming out. So, of course, I immediately invited him to come on Crime Redefined when his book dropped. But, man, who knew that right after his book came out early this year, we would be in the area of George Floyd and similar tragedies. And Tim's expertise is really, you know, right now in the forefront of the media. Yeah, I'm excited when you brought it up and even more now because you need someone with uh, Tim's background to separate fact from fiction. Speaking of Tim's book, it's entitled A Deep Dive, An Expert Analysis of Police Procedure, Use of Force, and Wrongful Convictions. It's an eye-opener from a guy who has all of the right credentials. Tim was with the LAPD for 29 years before retiring in 2003 at the rank of Senior Detective Supervisors. If you think about it, he was at the LAPD through Rodney King, O.J. Simpson, the Rampart Scandal. I mean, you name it, he's been there. And since 2003, Tim has operated T.T. Williams Jr. Investigations Incorporated in Los Angeles, just down the street from me. Tim is conducting expert consultation and testimony in criminal and civil matters. He's analyzed over 1,200 cases and testified in more than 200 of those. Among the high-profile cases he's been involved in are the Grim Sleeper, the Englewood Four, and the Cash D Register wrongful conviction matter. When does this guy sleep? He's making me feel like kind of a loser, like what I've done with my life listening to this guy's resume, you know. Uh, Tim has also appeared as an expert contributor on various networks, uh, cable and radio programs, including 2020, Good Morning America, CNN, Fox, and Inside Edition. Tim has been called on quite a bit as of late to comment on the current rash of police excessive force cases that are now coming to light. Tim's book is a very important read. And not just for practitioners and students in the justice system, but I would say for the general public as well, so that we can all gain a better understanding of these hot issues that are in the headlines. So get ready for a deep dive into the criminal justice system, crime redefined style. Tim, congratulations on your book, and thank you so much for joining us today on Crime Redefined. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for the congratulations on my first endeavor as an author. Absolutely. So when did you first consider the possibility of writing this book? And what was it that prompted you to just go ahead and do it? Well, I've been playing with writing for several years. And um, um, I decided to uh, write in earnest when I got tired of answering the same questions. Well, what is it that you do? What is it to you? What is what is a police procedure expert mean and things of this nature. So I started to put it in writing and um, as I was writing, um, I've, you know, uh, this book was not only good for, for the public, it was good for uh, law students, it's good for attorneys, it's good for judges. Um, and I found out it was good for other industries that, are, that, are, that, are, that is not uh, criminal justice related. Um, I, got uh, re- feedback on uh, my uh, Amazon.com from folk who read my book, and and they, they're writing um, uh, reviews from other disciplines. That's fantastic, Tim. Let me, uh, first of all, let me say it's great to have you with us today on Crime Redefined. Well, thank you. And my first question is actually just to get more into the mechanics. Tell us about the process of being a first-time writer and author, like just the day-to-day discipline and all the mechanics that went into developing the book. Well, the first thing I did, I, I wrote 
titles of, of, of what I wanted to, or uh, issues that I wanted to talk about. And they end up to be titles of, of chapters. And um, um, as I, I wrote, uh, that list was modified. Um, um, and um, what you see was not my original uh, version of what I wanted to write about. Um, I, what I did, I set an hour a day to write. Nothing more, nothing more. I sat down an hour a day to 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 focus on my on my writing. Um, and if there were some times where I had a writer's block, I just shut it down for that day. Didn't waste time trying to make it work. And um, and that's what I that's what I did. Um, I I didn't. I, my goal was not to write a a three or four hundred page book, but to write something that was simple and easy. So that the reader can, can get through it and understand what it was about. Um, I also I didn't um, I did a deep dive in my in my book, but I didn't I didn't give all the answers in the book because you know if you give all the answers, then why why would you hire Tim Williams? You can read this book and right. get the answers. <laughs> good good point. I, I want to. I'm a you know part time writer as well. And I was wondering, did you establish like a Instead of a man cave, a writer's cave, did you have a place carved out in your home where you just locked yourself up and put a do not disturb on your door? No, I have a very spacious office space. I have my own suite. I have a big office and I have a, a, a working area that I have a conference room. So I, I can isolate myself and I close the door to my office and, and I tell my assistant, uh, don't bother me for an hour. And, um, and uh, that's what I did. I didn't have uh, the same time every day. I, you know, cause I, you know, I have cases and, and I have to deal with attorneys and what, what I normally do was try to come in early in the morning and I might really rise. So I get up at three or four o'clock in the morning and it's, which is not an issue for me. And um, I'll try to get to the office about six and from six to seven, I write. Well, uh, Tim, I recall in back in the eighties, the controversy with LAPD and the chokeholds and all the stuff that Daryl Gates was saying. Why do you think that so many agencies are just now, four decades later, finally having the conversation about getting rid of this chokehold? Well, you got to remember there was two chokeholds. There was a bar arm, which was used, and that was what um, was a thing of the 80s. And um, um, that was uh, a band, and it, in fact, it was banned all across the country. What remained was the carotid chokehold, uh, which is being talked about today. And um, there are some agencies that I've that I've you know that I know banded it years ago because of liability issues. And I found that out doing a lot of civil rights cases. And there's some agencies who's kept it, LAPD, LAPD being one and a lot of other agencies throughout the country. Well, this is now costing municipalities millions and millions of dollars. So mm -hmm. Uh, there's that that tool will soon be gone. Um, the um, what has to be done, though, it has to be done, in my opinion, from the federal level, because some municipalities will try to hold out on that until they can't hold out on it anymore. And if it's started from the federal level all the way down mandated, um, I think that uh, you will get uh, nationwide compliance in that area. You know, Tim, I'm curious, during your time, with the LAPD, what type of any of racial bias training was being provided to officers? None. Um, <laughs> wow. The, um, that explains a lot, right? Yeah. There was, when I was in academy, you had racial sensitivity training uh, class. It was done by a black. And, um, and that is the only uh, training that, 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 that you've got. You may have gotten some sprinkling of certain types of discussions depending on what classes or schools you went to, if you were going to a supervisory leadership institute or West Point or things of that nature. You may got a sprinkling of that type of discussion, uh, uh, um, ethnic uh, uh, racial uh, uh, discussion. But as far as, as intentional training, um, uh, that, uh, that was, that was absent. Can you define the class? Are we talking about an hour all day? Um, when I tell you a class, like when I went to West Point, uh, Leadership Institute, that was a, uh, I think it was a four month training. 
and you had to read um, a cadre of books. Uh, you had to, you know, write reports on those books, uh, discuss them, and it was a and and you had training from from managers and mid managers from all across the country, and you talk about issues of law enforcement uh, of of at that time, and I and I went, I believe, in the um, in the mid '90s is when I went to uh, West Point, um, a Supervisory Leadership Institute. Um, you, as I had post as peace officer standard and training, and uh, that was um, 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 given, and that covers supervisors from all over California. And um, we we talked about that. In fact, in in supervisory leadership training, uh, there was a book that was written by a Black Panther that was required reading. And there were individuals, um, uh, some whites in the class that refused to read the book. And uh, so they said, uh, the instructor said, if you don't read it, you take your, take your behind back home and I will call the chief and, um, and, and uh, we will make sure that you will get no more of this type of training for post. And um, uh, that changed the morale. So they read the books. And um, so, you, you know, the, you, you, if you're dealing with with the law enforcement, you represent a, a very diversified community, and your your training has to be diversified in nature. It's got to cover everybody, yeah, and, and it has to embrace everybody. Yes, right. correct. Uh, Tim, I, I've heard you mention a line about the two Rodeo drives. How, how does that go? Well, there was <laughs> there was um, this this came in. This is a real this is a real live testimony. I was testifying in court and. Um, the DA asked me a question that the DA should have known the answer to. And she probably didn't think that I was gonna answer the way I was gonna answer it. And she says, is there are different types of, community, of policing in different communities? I says, yeah. I said, there's, there's, believe there's, 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 there's a different type of policing in the white community and there's different type of policing in the black and minority community. And I said, I'm gonna give you an example. There are two Rodeo drives in Southern California. One is in Beverly Hills, and one is in is, is in the minority community community now called Barack Obama Boulevard. And um, I says you get a very aggressive community of, of, of type of law enforcement approach in the Rodeo Drive now Barack Obama Boulevard in the in the minority community, and you get a different type of uh, basically a humane approach in the Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. And, um, and, and, you know, you should have seen the jury. They were, they were bobbing up and down with the heads and carrying on. And, uh, and the bottom line is that the defendant, um, uh, he got his due process and uh, uh, he was found not guilty. So the thing is that um, uh, there is differences of law enforcement in different communities and, and the community and the, uh, and, and the public needs to be aware of that. And if, if you talk about reform, and maybe we'll talk about that, but reform is 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 a is a very serious undertaking, and and a lot of folk don't understand what it really entails. You know, that's a great segue to my next question: Is that what changes have you seen with the LAPD since you retired? <laughs> None. Um, you know, and it's very sad. I, I have, I still have family in law enforcement and I have family in LAPD and, um, they, 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 they tell me that, uh, nothing's really changed. Um, but time they're to the point where, where they have a hard time getting blacks to keep me come on the department. And, um, and, uh, because of, of the disparate treatment that's, that, that they, that they receive in the minority and black communities. So there's really nothing that has, has changed. And what has to change is the type of individual that comes on the department. And I've talked about this in my many interviews since the uh, George uh, Floyd incident in Minneapolis. Uh, one of the things that has to take place is uh, you got to bring the right people on. And uh, you have people doing background investigations who are retired police officers, and I call them gatekeepers. And they bring in the same type of mentality into law enforcement that, that you need to change. Um, one of the things is core values. Um, when the, um, the core values, two core values are critical in my opinion. One is the reference for life. 
and the second core values are respective individuals, uh, you know, and, and those core values are, are for the most part, I'm not saying I don't like painting everything with a brushstroke, but for the most part are absent. I was testifying in Florida on a, a murder for hire case, attempted murder for hire case. It was a very, was a very high profile case and the, the media, there was, it had the total media coverage and, um, and they were in another room and then they had a camera and in, in the courtroom and uh, in those courtrooms in, in Florida, they, they're humongous. They, they will hold some like 80 people and um, it was, it was packed. And so I get in there, the DA asked me, so Mr. Williams, it says, isn't it true that LAPD uh, gave you your core values? It says, absolutely not. It says, my mother and father gave me my core values and I bought my core values to LAPD. And hopefully that I, I, I but that, that LAPD accepted some of my core values. And um, so the thing is that, you know, you know, there is a feeling that, you know, there's that culture, that law enforcement culture that has manifested itself to having problems in minority communities. And that, and that culture has to be changed uh, to make a difference in reform. So let me ask you this, Tim, when you retired from LAPD, and first began doing defense work on criminal matters. What was that transition like for you? And did you get any blowback from your former colleagues? Uh, I did, I got blowback and um, the transition was easy. Um, I, uh, the, you no, know, I was working at the highest level in the organization, I was working in Robbie Homicide Division. And I let the, the defense attorneys I was going up against, you know, they, I'm, I'm from the old school. Um, I had a lot of friends who were defense attorneys and, um, um, and, uh, and associates. And just because I'm working on one side doesn't mean that, that there, are, there are enemies. I mean, when I, uh, when I, was, when I came on the department um, in 1974, there was a camaraderie. You know, when you go in there in the courtroom, you're expected to do your job and do it the best of your ability. If you're a DA, expect you to do your job. If you're a defense attorney, expect you to do your job. In the day, you know, you go there, you may have your cocktails and you sit down and have lunch together and do what you need to do. But the, 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 you know, you don't, you don't, you don't see that, you don't see that anymore. And um, there is, there's that, that, that division and that them versus us. And um, it's, 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 um, and I talk about that as well in my book. Well, Tim, I read uh, that you said at an interview recently about the tear gassing of peaceful protesters in Richmond that if officers are that sensitive, they need to find another job and that's not the job for them. And, you know, I've often had that same thought when I see these instances of police seemingly overreacting. But my question about this is, is there something different about what's being taught at the academy level these days or maybe not being taught that's causing this problem? Well, it's again, it's a them versus us mentality. You forget, officers forget that they're servants of the community. And there are, there, there's different, there are certain times when the community gets upset because of what's been going on. Well, you know, there is, there is a right for peaceful demonstration. And you may not like what's being demonstrated about, but you have a right to protect those, those amendments, though that, that, that First Amendment right. And uh, that's, that's your job. And you don't, and 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 you find that's not not the case. And and in the um, in the in the Richmond case that I believe that I talked about, you had individuals that were operating independently of 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 a of a of a skirmish line, if you will, and just doing their own things, just tear gassing and, and spraying and doing doing all of that, which was not which was not necessary. And what they're doing, they're escalating something instead of trying de-escalating it. And, um, um, and, and if they're afraid or they, they get upset about name calling and things of this nature, then you need to find a job where the Bible call you a name. And, um, you know, the law enforcement it has a reward and reward for law enforcement can be a very, it's a, in some instances, can be a very dangerous profession. And these are things that, that, that you come in with your eyes, your, your eyes wide open, that should be wide open, and knowing that these things that you will face. Now, if you, if you're going to put uh, project street justice, then then you know that's and you end up going to jail, you end up going to prison, 
and and you end up causing your your municipality millions of dollars for your actions. Is this a, a deficiency in training of recruits in self defense and and hand to hand combat that is causing over reliance on weapons? Is that is that what what we're going or what, what the problem is? Part well, of the problem. I, well, it's I don't know if it's is you know the training that you get. You know, I've been through the training for my almost my whole thirty years on the department. The training is 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 good. It's the execution that you see in the street, which is bad. If if they have if they bring the training that they receive to the streets, that you may you may see different police departments. The thing is that you know is again I, I go back to this them versus us mentality, this law enforcement culture. Uh, you know that you know we're it's almost like you're the occupying force, and 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 you have that militarized approach and um and what you see on tv is not what police work should be like and uh, the, a lot of times the police work what you see on tv sends the wrong message and that's what police uh, work is supposed to be like and this you know the they they, they they hollywood sells this product for ratings and 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 their emmys and so on and so forth and the community suffers for this and um, not only the community, but um, everyone else that's recipient to this um, un, un, uh, bad policing. Also, too, if you look at the history of policing, um, is it emanated from during during slavery time, and and the police were they were catching runaway slaves and things of this nature, and doing those types of things. And the culture has manifested itself through generations up until until you see in 2020. I have a, a good, a quick follow up on that. So you mentioned culture a number of times, and if you had to put your finger on one fix, if there, you know, obviously there isn't one, but one thing to change the culture, what would it be? What could you point to? One word: leadership. So top down. Uh, top down, bottom up. It's like an accordion. You got to have supervisors on the on the front end. And you have to have the the chief on the on the on the top end have co coherent constitutional type leadership, and that would and it's like an accordion. If you bring the two sides together, you have the ear that's that that's, that comes out to make the noise. Well, if you you come together from the top to the bottom, you push it together, you have your bad officers leaving, and and then you and then you you push the bad out and you keep the good in. So in my, in my, my definition was one word leadership. You know, Elijah McCain has been back in the news recently, and he was the young African-American man in Colorado who last year was reportedly cuffed, put in a chokehold. And if that wasn't enough, apparently paramedics injected him with ketamine, which among other things is used as an animal tranquilizer. Tim, how often are citizens injected with drugs during an arrest, and is there is that ever really called for? No, it's, it's not called for. I, you know, they, you know, this is this was news to me when I heard about it. Um, you know, is is I mean, you went you went from bad to worse. Uh, you think that the that the paramedics would do something to save the man's life? They did something to, to cause his demise. So the thing is that you know you've got to again, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's like the wild wild west out there. And um, again, it's, it's a leadership. It's a leadership problem. Here's a man uh, coming from the store. He had a facial covering on his face before COVID-19 was out. Uh, he was a violinist, and uh, he was he was you know on track to become a very successful individual if he had to kept on doing what he was doing. And um, um, uh, and here he has he's been contacted by law enforcement and profiled. And ends up ends up dying, and um, so the thing is that you know again, again that culture that's out there has got is the law enforcement culture, the criminal justice system's culture, has got to change. This is kind of a part two to my my previous question, Tim. How culpable are law enforcement supervisors and brass in these incidents we're that we're seeing, such as the George Floyd tragedy? In my opinion, they're they're totally culpable. If um, when I do a lot of civil rights cases, I um, I if I get the case early, I instruct the attorney 
uh, advise their attorney to be sure to get all the supervisors, get the watch commander, get the commanding officer, um, get the bureau commanding officer, um, um, the sergeant, get them all involved in this lawsuit. Because there are many times I, I have reviewed and analyzed a discovery and I say, oh, here's the problem right here in this, the sergeant didn't do this, did that, the other. And I said, I, so I sit down and talk and converse and consult with the attorney that retained me. Oh, Tim, I forgot to tell you, he's not in the lawsuit. Well, guess what happens now you lost your case because that person that needs to be in a lawsuit wasn't. And, but for if he had done his or her job, we wouldn't be here looking at this matter. As a chief of police, anytime a law enforcement agency is sued, uh, that person is always involved in the lawsuit. So, uh, as as that as the chief is always involved, um, you bring you bring in the frontline supervisors as well as internal affairs um, and all their chain of command who who rubber stamps the investigation. You bring everybody into the into the mix, and then as you as you uh, triage the case. You'd always take people out, but you can't bring them in. Tim, in your book, you, you talked about a specific instance where a chief of police was subpoenaed. Um, tell us a little bit about how that went down in that case. Well, he, uh, the office, his office was subpoenaed to get him to come to court. It was a small, mis a small police agency. And uh, he told the, um, uh, I forget the, the, the nature of the case, but I believe that one of the officers was, in fact, um, being he ended up going to, uh, ended up going to prison, and um, on another on another issue, and, um, and so he asked the we he subpoenaed the plea the, the chief chief says I'm not coming, so he told the judge and the judge said well was he served and said yeah well yeah this, this officer was served, so she got uh, so the judge gets on the phone calls the chief office and tells the, whoever answered the phone that if Chief Thompson so is not in my office in 30 minutes, there'll be a warrant for his arrest, a <laughs> body attachment for him. And, um, and that, uh, that chief got there in 10 minutes. And, I'll bet. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of humorous, but it, it, it took that. It took that to respect uh, a summons of the court. Because when, when a subpoena is, is served, that's, that's coming from the court. The court's telling you to be there and you disrespecting the court but not being there. And, um, and um, so the, the, the judge says, you, you disrespect me once, it won't be a second time. You're not here in 30 minutes, you're, you know, there will be a body attached before you, you got there in 10. <laughs> well, Tim, you already alluded to your involvement in the Dahlia DiPolito case in Florida. Uh, tell us what, what the role of the TV show Cops had in that case, and what your thoughts are on the recent cancellation of TV shows like Cops and Live PD. Well, the thing is, one of the things I testified in the second trial, and that's where I came up with the hung jury, is almost like is is almost like there the investigation is being staged for TV instead of um, the they're 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 following what the detectives are doing. And um, there's certain things say, you know, you know, you know, a lot of stuff is confidential and you want you don't want that stuff out there. And um, I, you know, and then you had an informant that was uh, that was talking about and 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 it wasn't this informant wasn't supervised. Uh, you know, he was almost like um, telling uh, the defendant what to do and what to say. And and it was it was just it was just a chaotic mess. And um, from my perspective, and the uh, a jury agreed with it to the point where the jury came back. Uh, it was a, it was a, um, it was a hung jury. And then seven years later, I testified. No, a few years later, no, but maybe two years later, I, I testified again, and the and the jury came back, uh, uh, finding the finding her guilty. But the thing is that uh, I'm, I'm I have a strong opinion that. TB should not be involved in, in criminal investigations, a live criminal investigation. You want to have a, a segment where, where, where you sit down and talk to detectives after a case is adjudicated and follow through what has happened. That's fine. But when you're doing an investigation, you know, there is, um, you know, there, is, there are things that, 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 uh, that are subject to 
uh, exculpatory uh, issues as in, in court. Um, um, there may be things that that uh, that that may have some legal ramifications uh, um, that may be to the um, uh, defendant's um, detriment. And, 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 and there's as a whole lot of other things that that goes on. So that again, you know, that's why I'm glad to see those 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 type of shows being divorced from real live police work. All right, Tim, I've got a little bit of a curveball for you, and I I had to ask this question. I want to know what your role in the Grim Sleeper case and what was it like working working on that case. The Grim Sleeper case was a was a um, very interesting case. Uh, we it was a death penalty case and it was, um, uh, um, um, he was um, responsible for, um, um, I think it was 15 murders. DA had uh, some murders in the queue uh, in case uh, certain counts were lost. And um, it was um, a case I think I was on for about three, maybe a little over three years. Um, we had to, we had to get uh, more investigators on the case um, uh, because we had one investigator, and so I texted the DA. I mean, not the DA, but the defense attorney. If if you wouldn't mind if I talked to the to the judge who was appointing all the stuff, and he said sure. So I talked with uh, with the judge, and uh, we we went back and forth. He knew me from when I was working at RHD, Property Homicide Division. So I'm not, I wasn't a, a unknown uh, person to him. So we ended up, yeah, I said, I wanted four investigators. And he says, tell you what, I'll give you three. Well, I got two more than one. So that was, that was, that was great. So we, we got, we got that. Um, and, um, but it was, it was very difficult. Um, learn a lot of science. Um, the DNA, it was a DNA case. And um, we found some issues, you know, I'm not a scientist, but we found some issues there that, that other uh, uh, prior um, uh, serial killers DNA were, was present um, that would that had did murders on the on the Figueroa corridor uh, during that same time. Um, you know that was several series of, of murders going on during those days. So um, it was it was hard, it was hard it was a hard case. Um, a lot of um, tensions flaring up in court and. Um, um, and at the end of the day, we, we um, um, you know, Mr. Franklin was 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 convicted. Uh, he ended up dying in in San Quentin uh, about uh, about well, I think it's, I think about not quite a year now, about eight nine months ago, he he died um, of um, I think this the report said natural causes. So um, it's it's not the first high profile case I've handled, but it's the first. Uh, 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 serial murder of that magnitude that I've handled in this, and it's, it's more more controlling. When I say controlling, organizing the, the case and organizing the, the the individuals or the team around. And one of the things I had the responsibility of doing, I signed investigators certain uh, murders to investigate, and they had to report back and uh, trying. To, and then we had a DNA expert, and we got to look at all this stuff. And uh, come to, and then we had to have um, uh, meetings with the defense attorney, so that uh, he could be current and 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 be uh, in charge. Uh, no, new news, uh, new enough to to uh, question um, the, the the proper experts. But one of the things I walked away from is this: is that um, you got to put square pegs in square holes. Um, um, you need to have attorneys who are fluent, are very fluent in science, especially in DNA. And uh, the DA had their uh, had their 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 person who, in, who, prior to becoming a DA, was a scientist. And uh, so they, you know, you got to have, you got to put square pegs and square holes. And if you got to bring somebody in, and and have the court pay for it, you know, you got to do your job and make sure that that happens that way. Um, um, uh, in my opinion, um, it levels the playing field. Well, let's have a little fun here, Tim. Tell us some good stories about any outrageous things that opposing counsel has said or done to you during or after a case. And I know you got stories. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, there is, well, let me, let me see. Uh, it's not so much what they have done to me because opposing counsels, uh, they, they knew me when I was not an opposing counsel. They knew me when I was on, on the other side. Did that help but, or hurt you? Uh, it, 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 um, it helps, it helps me, it hurts them. <laughs> uh, because they they know I know the lay of the land and they know they know that I know where the skeletons are buried, so to speak. And um, the thing is that it is one case that um, it's not in the book, but it's it's uh, it's a case that I that I worked on. Um, this this um, guy um, he was a the suspect was um, arrested for robbery. I'm reading the reports and the. Um, he was a he was a pro per at, at the point in time I had the case. I'm reading the reports and this the suspect is about uh, five six to five seven, and um, and uh, the guy the, the the victim is was a positive identify identity. You know, he looked at the six pack and and um, you know, he, the victim was white and the defendant was black. So I go and visit uh, the guy in county jail and I visit this guy. And I'm, I'm looking at the arrest report, and the guy's six six. And you know, I said, "Well, this got to be a, an error." I um, go there, and man, I that guy had to be uh, every bit of six six, maybe more, and uh, close to three hundred pounds. So I sit down and talk to him. and says, uh, "How did uh, uh, how did you get picked out? Uh, is was was the <laughs> I, I I kind of I caused him a laugh. I said, was the uh, victim Ray Charles, and he just couldn't see you or, or what, you know. <laughs> and, um, and now he says, man, I wasn't even there, man, but I got picked up. And in the preliminary hearing, uh, they, they, they had him stand next to the, the victim, and he said, well, no, he wasn't that tall, but that's him. <laughs> 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 and uh, long, long and short of it, short of it uh, he was, you know, he was I'm not guilty for that crime, and uh, but you know that's I mean that's the absurdness that, that you see going on in the system, and um, and I you know I you know I gave my 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 vote a very detailed report, but you know why do I have why does an expert have to come in there and talk about the obvious and why you have to have a a, a, right. a, a uh, you know a a a, a, a demarcation expert come in. And talk about the obvious. So the thing is that you know is there. It's funny, but it's sad at the same time, because you know you have people that are convicted on BS, and um, and then ten to 15, 20 years later they get out of jail for a wrongful conviction, and then it cost the municipality millions of dollars. So you know. So the thing is that you know it's. Um, it's, 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 it's very, it's very sad in some businesses, you know, I talked about it in my book, it says the, the criminal justice system is on life support. And, um, you know, it's, you know, and, and it's, and it's very sad, you know, is you don't, you don't see, uh, justice being meted out too often in the system. Well, you, you actually uh, gave me the best segue ever. In fact, my question was, in your book, you write that the criminal justice system <laughs> is not entirely broken, but it is on life support. So my question then is, what can we do to at least get it off the ventilator, so to speak? Well, I, I, I use the term reform. Um, there, you know, um, I, I, I liken what we have seen, and I hope that I am wrong. I call it the altar call syndrome. For those who go to church and, you know, you, you hear a very rousing sermon. And then the pastor opens the doors to the church and people come down uh, committed to turn their lives around. But they come down because of emotion, not conversion. And what we have seen, and I, I've seen this in 1992 during the, during the Rodney King riots. And then I'm seeing this again in, and where, where the altar call syndrome was, was up front and, and central. Everybody was talking about reform, but there was no, they, they was, that conversion experience wasn't there. And to the point where it died. You just it just off. And, and now I'm, I, I'm just hoping you have, you had worldwide demonstrations behind the, um, 
George Floyd uh, killing. And and I, I'm just hoping that 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 the reform discussion will will take place, uh, or which will will benefit will will come to fruition. Not not the discussion, but true reform take place. It'll it'll right. actually stick this time. Yeah, well, it never it was never tried because we reform. A lot of people don't know what reform takes. Yeah, good point. And uh, reform is just not law enforcement. Law, uh, the criminal justice system is made up of law enforcement. The Department of Corrections, courts, uh, the probation, parole, uh, the juvenile system, Department of Ch uh, Children and Family Services. That's the criminal justice system, which is all broken. Because law it's, enforcement interacts with all that stuff. As part of the, that reform, I'm hearing this conversation quite a bit lately. How important is it to have officers come from the communities that they're serving? Well, I think it's important because they have a buy-in into the community. And I remember um, when I was up uh, uh, early in my career in Detroit, you couldn't be a Detroit officer unless you lived in a community, in the city of Detroit. Well, in LAPD, you got folk living in, in, uh, in outside the county. You have, you've had folk living in Yosemite. You've had folk living in Arizona. I mean, it's, it was just, it's just ridiculous. And um, there's no there's no buy into the community because you don't live there. You have you have you don't you just there's there's nothing there. No emotional and, attachment. And, and, and a good portion of the time you don't even live in the county. So so the thing is that it's it has its it has its it has its merits, but that's just one aspect. It's not reform. It it helps it helps deal with reform. Because you know now you have a buy-in in the community in which you in which you serve it, but reform has a whole different look, man. A whole different a whole different look, and you gotta you gotta deal with it from the inside. No one talks about um, the all these arrests and how many of these arrests end up being dismissed or re, or or rejects. And now you have a person that's been in the system, and and, and you know and 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 can't get a job and the, and you know. And now they have to, you know, they 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 have to do hustle to get to take care of their families. And um, the thing is that um, no one talks about that. There is when when a, no one talks about what happens after the arrest, and that's critical. But that's that's not sexy. That's not sexy to talk about. But it's it's what's feeding the the Department of Corrections, and that's what's feeding. Um, this issue of wrongful convictions, and this is what's 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 causing you know municipalities people to be pulled out of retirement for what they've done twenty or thirty years ago. So to follow up with that, Tim, you mentioned in your book that the filing prosecutors aren't as selective about the cases that they take forward as perhaps they once were, and that the detective supervisors who are screening these cases aren't screening them as well as they used to before they submit them to the DA's office. So what what's going on there? What's why is that? Well, you have supervisors or not supervisors and the detective side because they're not reviewing cases before they go to the DA. And I don't know what's going on in the DA's office um, that where they can't file coherent cases. <laughs> and um, um, you know and and there are you know there are folk that that um, DAs who who are now on the bench uh, or judges and who were filing uh, DAs when I was doing that stuff and I uh, see the the heads shake. So the thing is that, you know, um, uh, it's, it's a supervision problem from, from the law enforcement, supervision problem from the district attorney's office or the prosecutorial office. And, um, you know, uh, folk just trying to get, get numbers, get, a, you know, to make, to make arrests on the, on the, on the law enforcement side showing that they've got uh, 25 felony arrests for that one particular deployment period. DA is trying to get their their conviction so they can go up to the next rung to become a from a two to a three, from a three to a four, and and, and going up to a, a, a head deputy, which is a, a, a five, and, and the same thing on the city attorney side. So everything is about getting their ticket punched and and the uh, and the defendant be down, you know. And the majority of these defendants are minorities, and they're going through the system. They don't care. 
it's, it's obviously they don't care, you know, and um, and it's, and it's it's very very sad. And I talk about some of the stuff in my book. I mean, it, it's it's just sad. I mean, a a a a, a third and fourth grader wouldn't file this stuff. <laughs> I, I really, feel, but they're getting filed. I I really feel a lot of what you just described is what drives just a a, a ton of the stuff. I really yeah. do. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's the way the system is designed. The more convictions you get, the more promotions you're going to get. And, and the, um, and the best attorneys are not, are not getting promoted. So the thing is that in the same, and the best officers are not getting promoted. So, you know, it's not quantity it's quality. I mean, what's the quality of the cases that you, that you, that you're putting book in the system about I mean, I, I, I had a case, um, it was, um, this guy was arrested for, um, it was arrested, it's, it's, I can't get in too much of detail because it's, it's on the federal side now, but uh, in the civil rights side, but the thing is that what he, uh, what he, I mean, he was beaten and we got, and he had it on, and you have it on, on video, but the reports don't say the same thing. So what what you got here? You got you got uh, deputies who now need attorneys. So the thing is that you know it's um, it's 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 us very the system is very and and the public never knows about this. So obviously, uh, more sunlight on these issues, I think, will really would really help out. <clears throat> yeah, and 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 my and and my job is to level the playing field, but in the meantime, I I will talk about some of the stuff that I that I have to deal with, and it's and it's. And 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 this is it's not it's not a pretty picture, not at all. I've heard that term a lot, level the playing field, from my uh, partner here, Mayhol and Jerry. <laughs> Quite <laughs> well, a few thought, times. That's what Mayhol does. He, he levels the playing field. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys ever worked together? Oh yeah. Oh uh, yes. Huh. How, how many cases? I mean, there, there's quite a few that we're both on the same case. We may not know it necessarily. Um, you know, we're doing our independent thing, but I mean, it's a bit of a small world, you know, especially with the pro pers. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah. I guess we and, should and, uh, and, mention and, that at the and, top. And, and see what me Hill just stated is, 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 a, is, it's a bad byline. We work in the same case and don't know it. Right. Right. That's a problem. That's, that's yeah. A and that's point. a major problem. Yeah. I'm <laughs> curious to know your take on the news that the men's central jail uh, maybe potentially closing in the next year. Well, the thing is that you know you've had these 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 jails built in the fifties and and so on and so forth. Things deteriorate. You know, hell, I was I was born in the forties and I'm deteriorating. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you know the thing is that you know you keep on putting uh, duct tape and 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 all the stuff on to keep things together. I mean, it just doesn't work. And then you got you got this this pandemic that's 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 hit the world, and and is 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 is, is um, manifesting itself. In, in in the in the county jails in the prisons, um, uh, to the point where they they you have what you call it a criminal just you got pandemic in the criminal justice system, and and nothing is being done. So the thing is that you know there's again, it all comes down to issue of reform. Why do we have to have these issues these discussions? They know a doggone well that that things have to be have to, have to be done. They they were talking about doing away with this jail several years ago. And, and and guess what? You come right to the same, the same discussion. And what what does Einstein say? Doing the same thing over and over again is a is a definition of insanity. Right. And um, you know, I'm paraphrasing what he says, but you know, that's that's and that's totally insane. That's, do you think that's that, your leadership. That's your government leadership, local government. Do you think this is the time that uh, they mean? I guess we've probably asked this a number of times, but this is the time that do you think it really happens? Is there enough, you know, societal push? I'm I'm not optimistic because I've been around. I've seen this. I've seen this picture, this movie, before. Um, I'm not optimistic, and I hope that I'm wrong. I'm not optimistic that I I will I will see it if it, if it's if it's serious. I don't think that we'll be around to see 
the, the total reform because it's going to take anywhere from 15, 20 years yes, yeah. to make a, a major change because you're dealing with a system. And, and, and that's in that the, the system has many spokes and just law enforcement alone to turn that around, it's going to take, you know, about five to 10 years. You know, Tim, uh, I got to say uh, your timing for releasing this book is impeccable. <laughs> it's really been an interesting deep dive into how police operate and a useful tool for everyone in the criminal justice arena. And really, from for Mehul and, and myself, we can't thank you enough for uh, sharing it with us on uh, Crime Redefined today. It's well, been thank a pleasure. you so much. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it and, um, um, and, and, and share this with your colleagues, um, you know, because, again, it's not only good for the criminal justice system, it's good for all systems. You know, I don't know about uh, you, Mehul, but I was truly impressed with Tim's book and his interview. I found myself kind of getting lost thinking about his answers and almost forgetting to ask my next question. <laughs> yes, yes. It was definitely riveting listening to Tim. And, you know, we see the symptoms of the disease of the criminal justice system, but it seems like no one has taken the time to perform a full diagnosis on all body systems, if you will. But here, Tim has laid out the roadmap of how to do that from starting with background investigations of potential police officers to the supervision of police and prosecutors and to, to examining the culture of these institutions and finally exploring the motives for convictions and incarceration. You know, I agree. And I, as you said before, it's great that more and more wrongful convictions are getting exposed and reversed, but we also need warriors like you and Tim who can pre prevent them from happening in the first place, which is I think where these spotlights need to, need to be shined on. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Tim is definitely the man. I mean, he's pretty much considered an OG that we can all learn from. And I hope that this episode has been enlightening and thought provoking for our listeners as we digest the headlines of all the issues with the police these days. And just as a final point, you know, Tim was talking about what I would call scoreboarding, where a prosecutor or a prosecutorial office is just trying to get a conviction at all costs so that perhaps there's promotions, maybe there's a bigger budget for the office. And you think about it in that scenario, they're gonna be less likely to be receptive to requests from the defense for evidence, for retesting, for thorough discovery, because they're gonna perceive that not that that's good for justice, but that that's going to hurt their case and they may lose. And if you think about it, if you really believe that a man or woman that you are prosecuting should be in jail and that you want to give justice to the victims, you don't just want to earn the conviction, but you want to earn a conviction that sticks. So theoretically, you would want to have the defense be able to look at essentially whatever they wanted to, as long as it's reasonable, so that you prevent a lost appeal and then the case comes back. And I mean, I've had several, not several, but I've had some high profile cases where I've put in a request for DNA testing and the prosecutor is pretty much like, hey, test whatever you want. You know, I'm not worried about it. I don't have anything to hide. And I think they have the proper mindset that let's get this done properly as a system in the first place. So we're not messing with appeals and wrongful convictions and all of that. You know, like we said, let's do this right in the first place. And that's why people like Tim and I are critical to let's nip this in the bud uh, before 20, 30 years pass. You know, two quick comments. Do you think, um, one, everything you said would speed up the process? You wouldn't have, you know, these cases lasting, you know, decades in some cases, right? Right. If every, you could cut down the appeals. But when you, you know, kind of figure out that uh, the prosecution's holding back evidence and reports, et cetera, is that a, is that a tip? Is that a tell? I that, think it uh, is. You know, that it's maybe this is just kind of a scoreboarding case for them. Yeah, or you, whatever area you're poking in, you can kind of determine that, hey, you struck a nerve and that maybe there really is a weakness there. I mean, maybe there's a reason they don't want to turn yeah, it over. Yeah, good point. They know the chain of custody is weak. They know there's a problem with their officer, you know. So it's a, I guess it's an interesting psychological game as well, which I, it, it shouldn't be gamesmanship, but that's just the way it is. True, but that makes sense. Primer Define enthusiastically recommends Tim's book. 
a deep dive, an expert analysis of police procedure, use of force, and wrongful convictions. Get a copy at timwilliamsjr.com. You can also learn more about Tim's professional services at ttwilliamspi.com. Also check out his LinkedIn page where his recent media appearances are compiled. We sincerely appreciate all of our listeners and followers and appreciate your efforts in spreading the crime-defined message. You can also listen to all of our episodes at crimeredefined.com. And please do connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Thank you for listening to the Crime Redefined podcast. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Crime Redefined. Please send us your comments and questions and join us for the next episode.